This is another episode of Stand Up Comedy, your host and MC, celebrating 40 plus years on the fringe of show business. Stories, interviews, and comedy sets from the famous and not so famous. Here's your host and MC, Scott Edwards. Hi, and welcome to the first show of your host and MC. First off, let me thank the uh, announcer, Bob Stobener. He's been my partner off and on in several projects since the early 70s. And he not only did the uh, intro and outro, but he also did the artwork for uh, this podcast. So thank you to Bob. So folks, I want to share with you uh, why I'm doing this podcast, uh, what to expect from it. I'm going to give you a little story about how I got into comedy. And later on, we have a set from the very first act to touch my stage, Gary Shandling. So let's get started. Why a podcast? Well, I've been on the fringe of entertainment for over 40 years. I started off in the uh, 70s in the disco age as an MC, DJ, bouncer, and actually helped set up discos in some of the restaurants back in the day. I actually had a company called Sounds Good Music that actually was a partner with Bob, and we uh, got our start in music entertainment back in the uh, mid-70s. I'm doing this podcast because about a year ago, I started writing a book because I wanted to share stories about the uh, entertainers I'd worked with and share some of the stories from uh, 40 plus years in entertainment that I thought would be interesting and worth sharing. After a year's worth of work and I was running into some roadblocks, my wife, who's very smart, said I should do a podcast. Silly me, I'd never listened to one And wasn't even sure what one was. (laughs) But I jumped into it, did my studies, got the equipment. And this is the first show of many as we move forward and share great comedy bits, stories of the famous and not so famous, and really try to share the story of stand-up comedy from 1980 to present. What you can expect from this podcast is a new episode every Sunday. Each episode will feature either comedy sets of famous and not-so-famous comics, interviews with both comics and staff working comedy clubs, because, boy, they got some great stories, and stories shared by me of my interactions in the industry over those years. So let's get started. I was selling life insurance in the late 70s. You know, one of those high-end companies where the policy started at $2,500 and the big fancy policy was $10,000. And, you know, real legitimate ones, ones that paid off if you fell out of a plane, landed in a certain type of pine tree on a Tuesday. <laughs> they weren't great, but they helped fill some niches, and I was pretty good at selling them. I had taken a vacation from that job, and I was down in Los Angeles, and I spoke to my father, who's got a great sense of humor. And he was really wise and said I should go visit this small club over by the University of Los Angeles, That night at the Westwood Satellite Comedy Store, I was able to see a very young Dave Coulier, George Wallace, Sandra Bernhardt, and many others. It was magical. We had such a great time. We laughed hard all night long. We were so impressed we stayed late after the show to talk to the comics. As an entrepreneur, my mind was racing. I was noting how the staff worked, what the audience was like, and what was happening with the comics, and I had great questions for the entertainers. It just got my creative juices going. On the drive home from L.A., my girlfriend, Patty at the time, and I discussed the opportunity of doing something in Sacramento, a place that really needed some live entertainment. My comedy life was born. I was determined to do something new and different, get out of the life insurance business, and get into something I thought I could really be excited about. I have more to share with you, but first, let's hear from our official sponsor, DR Design. This episode's sponsor is DR Design and Remodel, flooring, tile, carpentry, and more. Located in beautiful Elk Grove, California at 10461 Grantline Road, just off Highway 99 near Sacramento. They do amazing bathroom and kitchen remodels, from design to construction completion, totally professional in every way. Their showroom features beautiful fixtures, a wide range of flooring, and design ideas to boggle the mind. Their on-site design staff will guide you through to see your dream home come true. 
So call DR Design and Remodel at 916-269-0451 to set an appointment or visit their showroom today. We want to thank DR Design and Remodel for being our sponsor. Hey, thanks to Deb and Rob. They do amazing work. In fact, they redid my house, and we love it. If you actually need somebody in Northern California to work on your kitchen or bath, give DR Design a call. Okay, let's go back to the world of comedy. The next day, I immediately quit my job as a life insurance agent and assessed my bills and did something really stupid. I went bankrupt (laughs) to get away from $2,800 of debt. Silly at the time, but it's what I felt I needed to do. Anyway, over the course of several weeks, I split my time between looking for possible locations to open a comedy showroom and driving to L.A. to meet with more comics and learn more about the business. I was really lucky because in those first few months, I was able to meet up with George Wallace and Dave Coulier, who then introduced me to Bob Saget, who then introduced me to Gary Shandling, and it was just on and on, and I was meeting all these great entertainers and learning all kinds of information on the best way to run a club, how to treat the comics, and how to make a living at it. Now remember, this was 1980, so people like George Wallace, Gary Shandling, and Bob Saget were still just cutting their teeth on stage, and this was well before they became famous. I also started frequenting clubs in San Francisco, clubs like The Punchline, owned by Bill Graham, the famous concert promoter, Cobb's Comedy Club, and most important, the Holy City Zoo. The zoo was maybe 22 seats crammed into a horribly small room with no service, but guys like Robin Williams and Paula Poundstone got their start there. I was able to visit these clubs and talk to the entertainers and learn all about the industry. And I always made a point of talking to whoever was managing or owned the clubs because they were so happy to share information on how the enterprise really operated. Later on, I realized a lot of my success in comedy was those early discussions with the comics and where they taught me on how to treat and respect the entertainers because I think that really led to the success of my life in comedy. I spent hours working up the cost of operating a room, renting a space, paying talent, marketing, staging, and getting some sort of comedy club going in this sleepy little Sacramento at the time. Something that would have the same feel as the Hungry Tiger in San Francisco or the original room at the comedy store on Sunset Boulevard. From my travels, I found out the very cost of talent and what I could charge at the door, and how important it was to sell food and drinks. No one could tell me how to market or advertise because I had already done that with two previous companies, so I was pretty confident about that. Several things were happening at the same time, and I apologize if this comes across a little chaotic, because it was. I was only 25 at the time, no job, little money, and barely getting by. But I was so excited about the potential, I was determined to make it work. I finally was able to negotiate the use of a banquet room in the basement of a restaurant called the Delta Queen in Old Sacramento. A gentleman by the name of Rich Will, an attorney who owned the building, made a deal with me where he got the food and drink and I was able to use the room for free, which was a great opportunity because that meant I could take whatever money I could get through the door, pay the comics, and if there was anything left, well, that was mine. It was hard, though, in those first days. It was just me in the beginning. I would have to tear down the banquet room, set up my comedy club, and then after the show, tear down the comedy club. And then during the event, I had to actually work the door, take the money, and then I emceed the shows. It was a lot of work, but I really loved it. I opened Laughs Unlimited in August of 1980. The very first act to hit my stage, Gary Shanling. And here he is. Very nice. I'm so excited to be here. I uh, had a great day. I went to the bank uh, earlier today. And, uh, have you gotten your free pen yet? These are free. I, you just yank these things and they pop right out. And uh, I got a desk calendar, too. Uh, you need a screwdriver to change the numbers, but they're free. And uh, then I went to the laundromat today because they have free clothes uh, at the laundromat. And uh, picked up a few things. And... Uh, I love going to the laundromat because you see people wearing the last thing they want to wear. Have you ever noticed that? People are wearing Bermuda shorts and a Nehru jacket. And uh, I just don't want to see that. 
Then I had dinner tonight at a little restaurant. You know, when you go in a place and they say, sit down, we're going to call you when your table's ready, and you sit down, and you listen for your name over some cheap speaker, you know, and you never hear your name. What you hear is, so, party you two? So. <laughs> Dennis, uh, you go ask him, honey. You look stupid. You go up there and find him. I'd feel funny, honey, but you're dressed for it. Go on up there. What they should do is just describe the people, see? Then we'd know who they're talking about. They could just go, the couple with the ugly children. Your table's ready. And we'd know it's these people over here. We're so sorry. Uh, you want to cover those kids up? We're going to try to eat here. Thank you very much. Is that a nuclear accident or what? My God. <laughs> I ate dinner last night at a friend of mine's house, and uh, he has, um, what do you call those things? A uh, baby. He has a baby, and uh, <laughs> I'm a single guy. I don't know how to relate to this too well, you know, and uh, the baby's crawling around on the carpet, and this baby uh, loads up his diaper, you know, and uh, I'm sitting there, you know, and the mother comes over and says, isn't that adorable? Brandon made a gift for daddy. Now, I'm figuring this guy's got to be real easy to shop for on Father's Day. I know what to get this guy, you know what I mean? Go ahead, Frank, open it up. Go ahead. Go ahead. I made it myself, Frank, and uh, I hope you like it. <laughs> I don't have any uh, babies. I have two dogs uh, from a previous marriage. I have, uh, I have a sheepdog and I have an Irish setter. I got to tell you about my dogs, okay? My, my sheepdog kicks when he sleeps, okay? Now, my friend said that means your dog's having a nightmare. Now, what's a nightmare for a dog? Did you ever stop to think about it? What, he's drinking out of the toilet and the lid falls? it for a dog, you know? I mean, uh, I had that one once myself and woke up <laughs> But I didn't kick in my sleep. The other, the other dog is this uh, Irish Setter, and uh, Irish Setters are too hyper and inbred, like my cousin Stuart. And uh, what happens when it thunders, she digs up the carpet to get underneath the carpet to get away from the thunder, and the vet gave me these animal tranquilizers to give her. You know, they're doggy downers or something. I, I don't know what they are, but they tasted uh, real minty, and they were hard to swallow. still goes under the carpet, but I go with her now. And, uh, <laughs> we have a great time. I can't wait for it to rain now. Now, <laughs> I was animal. It's so weird. I was camping up in Sequoia National Park, and uh, I'm Jewish, you know, and my friend said, hey, Jewish people don't camp. <laughs> and uh, we do. We just have it catered. That's all. And, uh, I'm up in the Sequoias. Uh, I'm staying at a Sheraton up there, and uh, <laughs> they, I'm out in the country, you know, I'm driving my car, and there's a cow on the side of the road. Now, we've all done this because we're mature adults. When you see a cow on the side of the road, you stick your head out the car window and go, moo. Like, we expect that cow to be thinking, hey, there's a cow driving that car. <laughs> How can he afford that? <laughs> that was Gary Shandling. He worked my stage as an opening act live in August of 1980. He was just learning his trade, and our club was his first out-of-town gig from his hometown of Tucson, Arizona. I met him through George Wallace, and later he became, of course, a very qualified headliner and several years after that, got his shot on The Tonight Show and ended up doing TV, um, movies, and I'm sure you remember him from The Larry Sanders Show. He was very successful. Sadly, we lost Gary Shandling in March of 2016 to heart failure. Stand-up lost a very funny comedian, but his humor lives on in the archives of the comedy world. I hope you enjoyed his set. I was now the proud owner of the first comedy club in Northern California and the sixth comedy club in the entire country. I was learning something new each and every night. Stay tuned for future podcasts and hear where comedy took me. Thank you for listening, and be sure to check out our website, www.standup.com.
yourhostedmc.com. On there, you'll find pictures from the past, items for sale, and I also do comedy training and consulting for special events and fundraisers. We hope you enjoy the future podcasts. As I mentioned in the beginning, there'll be a new one every Sunday. Be sure to listen, rate, and share. Thank you for listening to the first podcast of many of Stand Up Comedy, your host and MC. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Stand Up Comedy, your host and MC. For information on the show, merchandise, and our sponsors, or to send comments to Scott, visit our website at www.standupyourhostandmc.com. Look for more episodes soon and enjoy the world of stand up comedy. Visit a comedy showroom near you.